Greek, and he's going to talk about radiology for diagnosing and treating prostate cancer, what's new locally and globally. And Dr. Greek grew up in Nova Scotia, went to school at Queen's University, engineering, interesting, the University of British Columbia for a PhD in inter engineering, an MD and residency in radiology, the University of Colorado for a fellowship in interventional radiology, and the, yeah, the University of Calgary for a fellowship in cardiac MRI. Dr. Greek is a diagnostic radiologist, reading MRI, CAT scans, ultrasound, x-rays, etc., as well as an interventional radiologist performing treatments with image-guided procedures like angioplasty, biopsy, tumor ablation, etc. He's been at Island Health in Victoria since 2007. He is currently head of the MRI, and in his spare time he enjoys sailing the beautiful waters around Victoria and Vancouver Island. Please help me welcome him. Thank you very much, Gary, and thank you very much, everyone, uh, for having me here tonight, uh, Bill and Dan as well. Um, uh, as Gary mentioned, I'm going to be speaking about what's new around here uh, for in radiology as it pertains to uh, patients uh, who have prostate cancer, and also what's new elsewhere that might someday someday come here. Um, I, I'm a diagnostic and interventional radiologist, and I have a lot of interest in, in many of things I'm going to be speaking about, uh, particularly uh, MRI uh, and interventional radiology. A couple of things, I, I guess we can, we're sort of going to treat this as um, an introduction to medical imaging or radiology and how, how you might interact with it. I'm, I'm willing to bet that pretty much 100% of the people here have interacted with our department in one way or the other, be it just a simple chest x-ray uh, or an MRI or a CAT scan. Well, that almost everyone has. Um, when I was here previously a couple of years ago, I spoke mainly about MRI of the prostate because it was a big and very important thing. I'm going to go, we'll be touching on that and what's new there as well, but this will be more of a, a global thing. A couple of things I did want to mention before I started. I wonder if we could turn the lights down. Um, I'm in here all the time. There we go. Nice Wow, is that too dark for anyone? Or everyone good with that? A couple of things I was going to mention. Uh, first of all, I, I know that everyone here has been through very many uh, significant and uh, very different experiences uh, relating to their diagnoses. And a lot of times a talk like this, we're going over new technology, it comes off as sort of a, of a gadget display. But I just, I just wanted to say before we start that although we are going to be talking about all these gadgets and interesting things, it comes from a place that we're really trying to get better at diagnosing and characterizing and treating prostate cancer. Um, the second thing is that, uh, I'm sure everyone's probably aware of this, that I'm talking about mostly radiologists and my colleagues, but this is a real team effort. We, we deal on a daily basis, multiple times a day, with all of the urologists in particular for us, Dr. Hogue, uh, Dr. McCracken, Dr. Kenahan, Dr. Metcalf, uh, Dr. Bashu, uh, Dr. McCauley, all of them were, were all we all have each other on our, on our phones and, and go back and forth on a daily, if not hourly basis to sort some of these things out. So, at Island Health, we have our medical imaging department, and I'm sure you're aware of many of the different things we do there. We do x-rays, these are some of the old technologies that we still do and are very important. X-ray and ultrasound, ultrasound for prostate diagnosis for biopsy, of course, very important. And some of the more advanced diagnostic technologies that we use are nuclear medicine, such as bone scans and PET scans, which I'm sure many of you have, have had, and many of you probably are aware that we have a, a new PET scanner that will be important for, for prostate uh, cancer patients. CAT scans, um, MRI, which uh, we'll be talking about, and is very important for diagno diagnosis and characterizing prostate cancer. But, and so this is sort of our whole department. The thing that, I think maybe radiology flies under the radar a little bit, and, and we also have a component of our of our practice that, that I, I is dear to my heart called interventional radiology, where we do procedures such as angioplasties, not important for this 
bites perhaps, but other things like treatment of tumors, if someone's bleeding, to stop bleeding. Uh, certain procedures we do to help with pain. And there are certain procedures that are advanced procedures that are coming down the pipeline that, that might be done by urology, Dr. McCracken or Dr. Oak, or, or by us or by a team of us. I'll be mentioning those. So, what we're going to talk about today, like I said, this is just a stylized diagram of the prostate and the bladder and the seminal vesicles. We're going to be talking about what's available on Vancouver Island in 2019, and what particularly is new this year, and it's, it's a good year for that. And also what's not here, but is available globally or will be available here in the future. And some of these things will be coming soon here. So what, what can we do for you today and tomorrow? Um, the first things we're going to be talking about are sort of the more traditional things in radiology. If radiology is, um, you know, again, CAT scans, things, things to diagnose uh, prostate cancer. So MRI. Uh, in my entire talk last time was mostly on mostly on MRI, and uh, it's become even more important in the, in the two years since I've given the last talk. So, just to remind to remind people how MRI works, basically. You lie in a tube, almost all of our big equipment it looks, just looks like a tube. It's a giant magnet, a very strong magnet. And what that does is it stretches out water, water molecules. And then you hit the water molecules with a hammer, which in this case is just radio waves, actually the same frequency as FM, pretty close to FM radio waves. And that's like hitting the stretched water molecules with a hammer, and then they ring, and they, they release their own radio waves, which we detect with a big antenna. And all of these things are, are inside the table or inside this big tube. And we use that and we produce an image from it. In this case, I show a picture of a brain, but um, we also do prostate, of course. Um, and just to review this again uh, from last time, I'm not going to teach anyone to be a radiologist or anything, but I think it's important to have a, a look at the pictures and so you can appreciate what how things were done and how they will be done. Um, Prostate cancer on MRI, we're looking at a few things. Prostate cancer has more cells than normal prostate gland, and that'll make it bright on some pictures and dark on others. It has less water than other normal parts of the prostate gland, and that'll make it dark on this particular type of picture. And it also has more blood vessels, which when we give x-ray dye or MRI dye intravenously, it will light up. So we're looking at those three things. Does it have a lot of cells? Does it have less water than uh, normal prostate tissue? And uh, does it have more blood vessels than normal prostate tissue? So in this case, that's the prostate in green. In, they're in green again on a different type of MRI picture. And then the prostate cancer is this darker area here on this type of picture or the brighter area here on this type of picture. Just to orient you, this is the rectum and it's sort of a slice through the lower pelvis. And that's what we're looking at. And this, this is an easy one, it's a nice, bright, easy one to diagnose. And this became a really big deal a couple of years ago because it turns out that for people, for people presenting, or so appearing to their family doctor or to their urologist, with possible prostate cancer based on feeling a, a nodule or a PSA test, um, or even a diagnosed cancer from a biopsy that we're not sure how big it is. It turns out that MRI is very useful at helping to decide what kind of treatment somebody should get. Or if there's suspected prostate cancer, it can be very useful in telling people that they don't actually have prostate cancer and they don't need it. And it was, it was called a game-changing scan. And it, there's only been more and more evidence in the two years since we spoke about this last. So what is it used for? I'm not going to have a lot of text in this talk, but just a one texty slide. Um, it's, help, it's a useful test to find significant cancer in patients at increased risk. It is not a perfect test. And unfortunately, no test in medicine is ever perfect, no matter what anyone might try to have you believe. But it is a substantial improvement over what came before it, which was just PSA, digital rectal exam, 
uh, or just or what we call random biopsies, where the biopsies are taken at random. The MRI is a significant improvement over that. It's not for everyone. Not everyone needs an MRI, even if they have known prostate cancer. We use it to guide biopsies. And it's also used after a diagnosis sometimes to see how far it is spread, which help the urologists like, like Dr. Hogue decide to, uh, what kind of treatment they might use. Urologists and the, uh, the radiation and medical oncologists. We also work in the team with. And it may also be used to monitor disease progression, or if there's a sort of a mild cancer to do what's called active surveillance, which or watchful waiting, which people may have to see if it eventually needs treatment. In the future, the MRI may be used to actually guide treatment. And I say in the future, in the future on Vancouver Island. In some places in North America and Europe, it's already being used to guide guide therapy in real time. I'll, I'll talk about that in a moment. What's new about that here? We've been doing MRI for prostate for a few years now. Um, what's new, and I don't, some people may have heard, just actually just last month, and by last month, I actually mean just last week, we received a new, um, quote, state-of-the-art uh, MRI called a three-Tesla MRI. And there were two things we really wanted this magnet for um, in our meetings and discussions with people who donated money for it, with the people from the province who are spending your taxpayers' money on it. Um, and the, the reason this, this gadget really makes a difference, one is, one is for the heart. It's actually better at a lot of things, but the two real key applications for us that were going to make a big difference, one was the heart, but the other one was the prostate. This is a much stronger magnet than our other magnet we were using to do, to do prostate MRI. And it's known to be a lot more accurate at characterizing prostate cancer. And this is a picture of it. Uh, we just started using it last week. We did our first prostate scans on it last week. Um, and we're very happy so far. And just to give you an example, magnets are created by their strength, the strength of their magnetic field, which is measured in Tesla or T. So our old one is 1.5 T. Um, and our new one is 3 T. Uh, so that's twice twice as strong. And then, like I said, the MRI can look at prostate cancer because it can tell are there a lot of cells, too many cells, more cells than there should be. Is there too little water? And are there too many blood vessels? So I'm going to show you some comparisons between what's actually a similar cancer between looking at it on our old 1.5 Tesla MRI compared to the new one. So here's one of our old ones. This is the prostate gland here. I've magged it up so it's easy to see. And there's a little black spot here. And this is looking at cells. So the black spot on this has a lot of cells. That's the, the prostate cancer. Now on our new 3T magnet, believe it or not, this is about, as far as we can tell, about the same size of a, um, a prostate cancer. This is the prostate cancer, much easier to see. And in this case, we did, on the way, I didn't show you one where we missed anything, but if it was much smaller than this, um, and this patient did get treated, I needed treatment, but if it was much smaller than this, it wouldn't show up on the MRI. Um, these type of pictures on MRI look at water, and water is brighter on this one. And this very vague area here, is the prostate cancer. Now, if we look at our new one, it's much, probably hard for you to appreciate, but uh, it's much larger, and to me, much more prominent region is the prostate cancer, much easier to see. Blood vessels, this is, again, all these are on the top are the same tumor, this one here. Blood vessels, blood, prostate cancer usually lights up somewhat because it has too many blood vessels, what we call neovascularity. And believe it or not, again, this little, vague area here, which you might not really appreciate if you put an arrow on it, is the prostate cancer. Now on, our, on the new magnet, there is no missing this one. It's just much, much better. So that's 2019 on Vancouver Island. The other thing we do, prior, prior to using MRI, um, 
what used to happen, and I'm sure many people, and still does, and it's still appropriate in many cases, is that random biopsies of the prostate are taken. But what we can do now is take the MRI, find where the tumor is. Unfortunately, we can't biopsy the tumor in the MRI, but we can take the MRI pictures and digitally staple them to ultrasound pictures, which we can do, use to do biopsy. And that's called fusion biopsy. We've been doing this for a while. Um, that's not so much new in 2019, but uh, this is our ultrasound probe. Backwards here, sorry. But what is new and is in the works, but I won't spend too much time on this because it's a bit, a bit beyond the scope of the meeting and it's a bit, maybe a bit esoteric, but uh, is a new system to do that that does a lot of these steps automatically um, and digitally, and so, sort of like using uh, artificial intelligence to, to help find the cancer and then to help stable the MRI images to the ultrasound. Again, I just mentioned that because it is a new thing that's coming up. And hopefully coming soon, we're, we're trying to get this. The other thing you may have heard of is the PET-CT scanner. Not, uh, this is a dog scan, not a cat scan. <laughs> uh, right. um, so, um, I'm, I'm sure many of you have had a PET scan. And, for prostate cancer or otherwise. And I'm just going to describe a little bit, I think it, in general terms, how they work. I think it's actually sort of interesting and it is, it is kind of uh, useful to know. A re what we'll call a regular PET scan, there's a formal name for it called 18 FDG PET, which is, but we'll just call it a regular, the most common PET scan. What actually happens is they take some sugar, not actually Roger's sugar, but glucose, and they add a radioactive, they make it radioactive inject it in your arm, then tumors like sugar a lot, most tumors, including prostate cancer, like sugar. And so the tumors take up the sugar, and then because the sugar is radioactive, it can be detected in this, in this PET scanner. And that's all PET scanning is. Um, then we get a picture um, like this, and this is uh, a regular PET scan. It's a PET CT scan, so the PET part of it is actually this orange, all this bright stuff, and it's a combination of a PET scanner and a CAT scanner. And the CAT scanner part of it is all the sort of gray stuff, and then they get stapled together. The CAT scanner tells you where all the organs are, and the PET scanner tells you where the tumor is. Um, in this case, this, this is the tumor up here in the lung, in this particular example. And a lot of this other stuff in the bladder, this is your the bladder, this is the liver, this is some of the stomach, this is the heart. There's some kind of a, a, what we call low-level uptake. And in many cancers, such as lung cancer and breast cancer, that's not too much of a problem because the tumors are really bright. But prostate cancer, this kind of PET scan can still be useful, but it's, it's not all that sensitive. It's not, and by sensitive, I mean able to pick up small tumors. But this has been around you know, for a while, but we just got on the island only, again, only this summer, our first PET scan. Prior to that, people had to go to Vancouver for this type of scan. And that's, that's new here. It will be very important for many cancer patients, including some prostate cancer patients. So that's our new PET scanner, our new PET CT scanner. They all kind of look the same, right? CAT scanners, MRI, PET scanners are all just a big donut. I realized that I was putting this talk together, so like, cancer scanners look the same. What is more important for prostate cancer patients is a different kind of test that you may or may not have heard of called a PSMA PET scan. And that stands for prostate specific membrane antigen. It's just a big word. And what that what that is, is instead of instead of putting a radioactive dot on the sugar molecule, they put a radioactive dot on something that really likes to stick to prostate cancer cells. And this is an example of a, a PSMA PET scan. Um, there will be a little what we call uptake. This is the spleen, this is the liver, that's normal. The rest of this gray stuff is all the CAT scanner part of it, so we can see where the organs are. This is the spine, these are the lungs. Um, and you see, unfortunately, this monitor is really, really good. One's on the 
I don't know if you can appreciate it. Can anyone appreciate that there's another little dot right here? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, so that's that little dot is prostate cancer. And you can imagine, if we went back to the this type of scan, there's the bladder, there's all this what we call low-level uptake, sort of orange stuff. You'd never see that. Whereas on what's called a PSMA PET scan, it's easy to eat you. It's very, very sensitive to picking up small amounts of prostate cancer. And that's often done if people have had treatment for prostate cancer and their PSA starts to go up. And the urologist or the medical oncologist or the radiation oncologist needs to know where and how much or if any uh, tumor has come back because that will make a difference in deciding should someone get no treatment or someone could get possibly surgery to remove some recurrent, treat, recurrent disease or some radiation or some chemotherapy and this scan will be very good for them. We don't have PSMA PET here right now but the only reason for that is because We've just started with our PET scanner, and it takes a while to ramp up all the different applications. So <coughs> the regular stuff is going first, and this will eventually be here, I am sure. Excuse me. Yes. How high does the PSA have to be before they are same for PSA? Uh, that's probably a better question for Dr. Ho, but, but basically, uh, there are, it depends what kind of treatment someone had. I mean, if, if they've had a, a prostatectomy with curative intent, basically the PSA should be essentially zero. If they've had other treatments, and again, I'm a radiologist, so I know this because I, I deal with my oncology and urology colleagues, but they're actually better people to ask about this. If, they've had other, if you've had other treatments that are not expected to completely get rid of all prostate tissue, then it's more following, following the trend. But if there's been a prostatectomy, sort of any that Called, that's called biochemical recurrence. So now we'll go on to treatment and interventional radiology. And <coughs> I'll, I'll say sort of a disclaimer in advance. Uh, much of the, we treat a lot of prostate cancer patients for a variety of things, but I, we're not currently treating the cancer itself in radiology. Um, but that is a, a future possibility or a, a teamwork between radiology and urology. Um, this is us, this is all our radiologists. Uh, that's me, that's a couple of my colleagues, one of our nurses and techs. Um, what do we do in radiology? We do procedures to stop bleeding, and that can be important with tumors, including prostate cancer that can sometimes bleed, or even just an enlarged prostate. We relieve obstructions. We relieve obstructions in many areas, including liver, kidney, bowel, uh, blood vessels, arteries, and what's probably more relevant to prostate cancer patients here is that if there's an obstruction of the ureters or an obstruction of the kidney, whereas sometimes in conjunction with the urologists, the people who go in and relieve those obstructions. We do several procedures to kill tumors. Um, right now, we're not treating prostate cancer, um, uh, but we do treat sometimes metastases from various tumors. and. In the future, and I'll show you a couple of things that are coming down the pipeline, possibly in, in conjunction with urology as a team, we may be involved in some of those things. We do procedures to relieve pain that can be important for, for some prostate cancer patients, including uh, spine injections uh, and a variety of other procedures. We drain fluid, abnormal fluid collections after surgery, like abscesses or urine leaks and that sort of thing. Uh, one of the things we're going to mention that we do, I mentioned we stopped bleeding. A procedure that we've started doing recently is called prostate artery embolization. And I should, I'll, we'll say again, this is not to treat prostate cancer. This is mainly to treat bleeding, which can be from prostate cancer. Um, although it's a relatively uncommon thing for us to have to do in, in that regard. Uh, and it's, it's really more used to treat people with large prostates who have problems with urination, who aren't good candidates for the urology procedures uh, where they go up and, and remote the middle of the prostate, either because they're not a good surgical candidate or the prostate is so big they couldn't possibly undergo surgery. And it's an interesting procedure. What we do is we go in through the artery, usually in the groin or the wrist, and feed a little tube up 
here's the bladder, here's the prostate, a little tube up and into the blood supply to first one side and then the other side of the prostate, and we block off the blood vessels. And that causes parts of the prostate to die, and the prostate will get smaller. That will help relieve urinary symptoms. If the problem was originally bleeding, it will also stop bleeding. We've only started doing these just last year, and we've done probably a dozen now for various reasons. Now, it used to be that people with prostate cancer weren't even allowed to have this procedure, but that's actually, uh, that's actually changed to some extent. The, couple, the last couple of things I'm going to mention, and again, this is something we do have on the island in 2019. The last couple of things I'm going to mention, we don't have on the island. These are sort of things that are available elsewhere. In some places, they're sort of investigative or experimental, but in some places, they're offered, uh, they're offered to patients as, as a type of therapy of choice. Um, and one is called cryotherapy. And these are things you may hear of, where the urologist, possibly in conjunction with the interventional radiologist like myself, go in and basically freeze the tumor. So cryotherapy has comes from cryotherapy, which means cold treatment. So and the tumor will be frozen. And what would happen is, and this also uh, speaks to what I was mentioning regarding using the MRI to guide treatment in the future. The MRI would be obtained, find the tumor, verify it with a biopsy. And then what can be done is you can use that information from the MRI in conjunction with the ultrasound by pasting them together uh, and using one of those advanced digital systems that I, I showed you earlier. And then guide a needle into the prostate where the tumor is <coughs> and freeze it. Um, and the freezing is done by introducing uh, introducing argon and or helium gases which will, which will expand and uh, cause, uh, cause the area tip the needle to get extremely cold and kill the tumor. Um, so that, that would be the setup here. There'd be an ultrasound machine in the rectum, and then using that ultrasound pasted to the MRI images, needles would be guided into the prostate here to the area of the tumor, and it would be frozen. And now you might say, what's the advantage of this? There's other treatments available anyway. There are some, and maybe it's a good question. Maybe some of the other treatments aren't just as good as this. This is relatively new treatment. It's thought that it might, there might be a, a niche for this, or there probably is a niche for this because it's tolerated very well. You don't have to be in the hospital for very long. There are relatively few side effects. It preserves the nerves and usually doesn't affect the urethra. Um, and it's fairly effective. We don't have this here, of course. This is a sort of a, a wish list down the road. Um, Another very, I wouldn't call it a similar therapy, but uh, similar in, in idea anyway, is something called, that you may read about uh, if, you, if you Google search different treatments for, for smaller prostate cancers, is irreversible electroporation. And that sound, that's a giant word, but all irreversible electroporation means is poking big holes with electricity. So the irreversible, so you have to kind of go backwards. The poration means poking holes in cancer cells. That's poration. The electro means we're just using electric fields to do it. So that's electroporation, means poking holes with electricity. And the irreversible means we make the holes big enough that they won't seal over, and then the cell dies. Um, it does use electricity, but it doesn't actually cause any heating. Uh, it's what's called a non-thermal <coughs> Uh, ablation technique, so it doesn't actually cause any heating, but it might damage things in the area. It's also known as something called Nanonife. It's called Nanonife because that's the, the company that makes, there's only one company that makes this. Um, and that's that's the name they've given their, their system, which I, which I show here. And it would basically be the same idea as the cryotherapy. We have an ultrasound machine and needles that go in, but instead of freezing it, you apply an electric field very short, very high voltage electric field, just for a few mill for a few milliseconds, and that causes holes to form in the cancer cells, and they die. And again, we don't have that here. It is available in some places, even in Canada. I think there's one or two places that have this available. It's you know, it's something that's a, that's a niche thing, and it remains to be seen how important it will be. So, but um, you know, maybe in the future, this is something that 
radiology and, and urology will team up on, who knows. Um, we did just submit an application uh, last month to, to obtain this device that, uh, I, it was kind of a shot in the dark, I don't, I, I kinda don't know if it'll go through or not, but one never knows. Um, but just for you to be aware, and I, that's about it, so I just wanna thank you for your patience. Again, I didn't, uh, it sort of was a, an overview of, of gadgetry, but it's really, it's coming from a place where we're trying we're trying to make things better from from the area that we can make things better. And I think everyone, be it medical oncology or urology, is really the, the, the central specialty for you guys. But medical oncology or radiation oncology, or us, we've all got our our particular viewpoint of, of prostate cancer, and we try to you know approach it and make it better using the tools that, that we have, and that's what we've done. And so I just wanted to say that we're we are working on this, or could be me shoveling stuff at you tonight, who knows? But, uh, um, and thank you for your time and patience. And if there's any questions, I'd be happy to take them. Maybe we can turn the lights off. so I don't have the experience doing it, but in, I've read most of the literature and in, in other other cancers, like prostate or like pancreatic cancer, it's it's used on on the tissue outside of the outside of the prostate outside of the pancreas pancreas gland. That technique is in its early days. It remains to be seen. It's two big areas of pancreas and prostate. Um, it remains to be seen how far it will go, but it is used for both. And so yes, you could, you could theoretically at least use it. Most of the papers are using it for disease confined to the plastic plant. Um, I, I also was remiss because there was another one that I'm sure you will read about if you haven't already, called HIFU, High Intensity Focused Ultrasound. And that is also a treatment that's available. And what's done there is instead of using ultrasound to, to look at the prostate, Ultrasound, very high energy ultrasound, is focused on the tumor. Uh, it's not something that it, that I would probably ever be involved in, so I didn't, I didn't include it. But it sort of goes along with those other things, sort of less invasive, uh, but non chemotherapy based techniques. This question may already have been asked, but I missed the answer. But everything goes around your PSA and. <clears throat> It seems to me that there's a number, your PSA, let's say it's zero, and it goes to 0.2, and then it goes to 0.4, and then it goes to 0.6, and you go in to get a, a, a PET scan, there's a chance, that the PSA has to be above a number before the, even the PET scan can pick up. Sure, yeah. I mean, So you can get a false reading. You can go in at 0.6, and it comes back and says you have no tumor, and that's not true, but it, it doesn't have to be like a one or two uh, or there's five. No, so there's not going to be an exact cutoff number. Um, but it's, it's absolutely true that with you can actually have a high. We had uh, we do rounds with the oncologists, medical and radiation, and the urologists, and ourselves. We do them every two weeks, um, and probably a third of the cases we deal with are prostate cancer. And just this past week, there was a patient with an extremely high PSA and had a, had a basically negative PET. And it's, it's pot. Any medical test, the higher your PSA, the more likely it is you're going to, you're, you're going to show up absolutely. And if your PSA is, you know, very low, it's probably not useful. Um, but it, it, that's a good point. It's an excellent point, but it, it also goes to, I hate saying this because it sounds like a cop out, but I, I think you know, for a lot of medical tests, especially imaging tests, there's an impression that there are always yes or no answers, and, and unfortunately, they're not. Some things are almost yes or no, like a CAT scan for appendicitis, it's almost yes or no, or a 
you know, a CAT scan for a hip fracture, that's pretty close to yes or no, but most other things, it's sort of yes means very probably but not definitely, and no means very probably not but not definitely not. And it's just, you know, we try to make those gray zones smaller and smaller as time goes by, and, and we have, I mean, things have gotten much better, but it remains that no test is better. Um, currently, a lot of fellows who are diagnosed with prostate cancer will do the PSA test, digital rectal, biopsy, MRI, CT. Do you ever see the PSMA PET becoming the diagnostic tool to bypass, um, you know, I, the other scans? I don't think it'll ever replace all of those other things. Um, like, you could imagine it replacing the CAT scan, because the CAT scan is often looking, and the bone scan. Uh, because they're often looking for disease elsewhere. Um, the MRI probably won't replace, and the reason for that is the, you can't use the PET scan to guide a biopsy. Uh, it's just not that type of imaging, but you can use, although we've tried a couple of times, uh, very constant success, but you can use um, the MRI to guide biopsy. But yeah, it's possible. Uh, Good question for Dr. Forkheim, one of my partners, or uh, Dr. Andrew, who are the director for our side of the PET scan. One of the issues with the PSMA PET scan is tagging the antigen. It has a limited lifespan. Uh, where is that done? I know it's done in Vancouver. But yeah, it's done in Vancouver now, and I'm, I called my colleagues today, uh, and I understand we will have PSMA PET here. Hmm. Uh, I was told. Um, it's, there's different things you can tag it. There's two different things you can tag it with. One's called gallium-68 and one's called uh, fluorine-18, fluorine glucose. Um, that's the, the sugar. Hmm. Uh, the one that was used on the sugar, but you can also use it on the other, the other sticky thing. Um, and we hopefully can get that here. So somebody, there would be a company that would make it or it would have to be bought in. Yeah, either have to be brought in or there'd have to be a generator here. Mm -hmm. uh, I should I should specify that nuclear medicine is not my subspecial area. Okay. I'm more the MRI guy. My department, but I'm more the MRI and guys. Cool. Yes? What would be a, you were saying, extremely high PSA reading? <clears throat> what would be a number on that? You, oh, you mean that uh, this case from this previous? Yeah, that you spoke I, I don't actually don't recall, I'm sorry. Well, is in the low, the high teens a, a high number? Well, it depends what you've had. If, if you know, if you've had a radical, if you had a prostatectomy with the curative intent, and these are better questions for the urologist. If you had a prostatectomy with the curative intent, you know, one is really high, right? You should, should be zero, right? Yeah. Um, uh, so it depends what kind of treatment has gone on in the past. The, the interpretation of the PSA is, can't be done sort of in isolation. If, if you've had a radical prostatectomy, then any any amount of PSA is abnormal because there should be no PSA producing cells in your body. Um, but if you've had other treatment, hormonal treatments, um, you know the, the cells that produce PSA are still there, and so my understanding is more of a trend. I'm just talking about the normal PSA test that went up and up and up on me until uh, they started, uh, the red flags went off at 16. Oh, right, yeah. So, that's all I'm asking, is that, you know, higher? Yeah, 16. Okay. So, this is the, um, I've had the Gallium 68 PSMA. Right. Indicated uh, some uh, tumor. Further surgery, nothing found. Uh, PSA is climbing rap rapidly. Where are they going to radiate? They don't know where it is. Right. Uh, are they going to start at my head? Or? Uh, I I could not answer your question. Uh, yeah, I would have to. I mean, I, cases. Uh, George, I hope I hope your case is reviewed at, at the, the rounds that occur every couple of weeks. 
yeah. and I'm sure I'm sure it probably is. Yes. Um, and and those things, like I said, no test, unfortunately, no test is perfect. Everything, if you go back 20 years from now, and compared it to now, our tests now would look like they're perfect. But if you go, you know, if you go forward from now, things are getting better. But PSMA, PSMA PET is an extremely good test, but it is it is not a perfect test. If the uh, if MRI can pinpoint uh, cancer on uh, prostate, why is it necessary to have a biopsy? Uh, that's a that's a good question. It, it's uh, so, and there's two, sort of two answers to that. One, it may not be necessary to do the shotgun biopsy that have always been done, what we call the random or systematic biopsies, where the, the entire gland is biopsied. But again, the no test is perfect, and I, I always feel bad saying that, but it's the truth. And we grade the MRI on a scale of one to five. And a five means, the technical definition of a five is that uh, prostate cancer is, quote, or significant prostate cancer is, quote, highly likely. In our experience, probably that's about a 95%. But that still means if we didn't do a biopsy, we would be treating, out of every 20 people, even in those cases, we're very certain. If we treat 20 people, we're going to be treating one person who didn't have cancer. And we, we can't do that. But what it does allow us to do is to do a very directed biopsy, a very limited biopsy. And it's been shown that using the MRI will detect more significant cancer and detect I don't know how this will be interpreted, but detect less cancer that's not important. And some forms of prostate cancer, frankly, aren't important. Some very, depending on the Gleason score, very small amount of Gleason 6. You probably don't want to know about that, to be very honest with you. That's my opinion. Because it won't do anything. Yes? Does the MRI actually map? Where the radiation should be applied, and it's a digital connection between the two systems. Uh, yeah, if so, if um, if they're doing it depends what kind of radiation they're doing. So with brachytherapy, with the beads, the beads just go everywhere. Um, sometimes they do stereotactic radiation or radiation to a to a particular area. In that case, they would use something like MRI. Often that's for recurrence. Um, uh, and, and they would use the information from the MRI to, to guide that. <clears throat> yes? If, if you have a lot of, um, you see a lot of, uh, say, deletion 6, you know, the low grade, yep. um, I mean, that, that would that could raise your PSA significantly, could it? It could, yep. Yeah. And, and which? So, I mean, a lot of, you could have a lot of deletion 6 to give you a PSA of, say, 12 or 13, but you could have a tiny little bit of deletion 8 and have a PSA of, say, 5. Yeah, there's and it would be more significant, even though the PSA is lower, yeah. but the deletion is a different deletion. The PSA is never, the PSA is used to, to, uh, to, to judge how worrisome prostate cancer is by the urologist. But there are several things that you should understand with PSA as an individual number. Um, you know, two, two Gleason 7 tumors that are the same size won't produce the same amount of PSA. That's thing number one. Thing number two is your prostate gland itself, the normal prostate gland, produces PSA. And so if you have, um, we measure the prostate in, in cubic centimeters, CC. So if you have a 150 cubic centimeter prostate gland, which is very large, you know, uh, then a PSA of, of five could be completely normal, um, or eight could be normal. If you have a prostate gland that's only 30 cc's, then a smaller PSA would be abnormal. And one way to characterize that is what's called uh, PSA density. And often the cutoff they use, so they take the PSA, 
and you divide it by the size of the prostate gland, and you get a number in nanograms per milliliter, uh, which is which is how the, the PSA comes out. Nanograms per milliliter per cc, and they typically use a cutoff of 0.15 for that. Um, and again, these are good questions for Dr. Hogan as well. Um, so, for example, um, if you have a hundred, let's have that work. If you had a hundred cc gland, you could have uh, a PSA of 15 would give you a point, a point one five. You know, that, so the, the PSA for a very large gland, the cutoff is much higher, and for a small gland, it's much lower. And that's what, there's other things they look at. Sometimes what's called free PSA versus protein-bound PSA. Um, and there are other things that can raise your PSA too, including uh, in inflammation and infection. How do they determine the size of a prostate gland? Uh, so either ultrasound or MRI or occasional CAT scan. So if you ever, if you get an ultrasound specifically for your prostate or an MRI, or the CAT scan is being done specifically for your prostate, we will usually tell uh, whoever your, your urologist or your oncologist what the size of the prostate is. It's fairly easy to measure. What branch of engineering did you take? I did an undergraduate degree in a combination of electrical engineering and, uh, and physics. And then I did a PhD in a combination of electrical engineering and biomedical engineering. Sounds like a perfect background for what you do. Yeah. <laughs> it worked out. It helps on occasion. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Dave.